here in Orlando with Gus Malzahn, Big 12 head coach. We were just talking before we started about the league, the Big 12, and uh, how, how there might be some kind of misconceptions. And, and you were a guy who worked in the SEC for years and years. You come to the Big 12. What, what was your first year through it? Like, what did it, what did it feel like? Yeah, first of all, there's a lot of real teams. And, uh, you know, in the past, there is that misconception that it was a seven-on-seven seven league. It was anything but, you know, but that. Uh, you know, teams line up, they try to bloody your nose. It's a real conference. There's no off weeks. Yeah. And there's a lot of parity. You have to play good football to win, whether you're at home or on the road. But uh, I was very impressed going through it the first year. Well, and that's the thing. I've heard you talk in the last few weeks about you, you did a lot of reflection. Six and seven was not up to your standard. And I, I had not realized. So in high school, as a high school coach and as a college coach, you never had a losing season. No. No. But you think about You look back on this season, the, the Oklahoma game, the Baylor game. This could have been a different win-loss record. How close do you feel you are to being competitive, you know, near the top of the Big 12? Yeah, I mean, um, you learn the first year, there's no doubt. And just to be completely honest, we didn't do a great job coaching. Anytime you had that many close losses, we lost a couple close home. You just talked about the Oklahoma. You know, you got a chance to seize a moment in a, in a huge win. We weren't able to do that. Uh, but I like where we're at. Uh, definitely did some self-reflection. Never lost, but when you do that, it gives you an opportunity. Okay, hey, what do we need to do? And we evaluate everything. Um, yeah. And we made some coordinator changes, uh, some staff changes. I really think that's going to help us. Um, you know, we brought in some defensive playmakers, uh, you know, from the portal that I think can help with our young guys that we got coming up. So I like where we're at, but, uh, you know, we're going to roll our sleeves up and go to work. So you got here, and you said you were never giving up play calling again. And then before last year, you said, I want to deal with the CEO stuff. But but by the middle end of the season, you're you're into the play calling again. Yeah. How did you reckon? You know, how did you figure that when you when you're doing that evaluation? Okay, I need to get back into this. No doubt. You know, in fairness, I think the last year and a half, two years, college football has changed so much. Yeah. And just from a head coach's standpoint, there's so much on the head coach now with the one-time transfer, the portal, the NIL fundraising, everything that goes with it. And so, from your common sense standpoint, like man especially at a place like this. We're a young school, yep. and I got to also be a fundraiser. And so that was the thinking. But by halfway through, you know, as a head coach, I'm always going to do what's best for our team to be successful. And I took back over, and I'm going to do it. And yeah. the bottom line is that's what I love to do. That's what that's what I like to do. You adjust. And I think every head coach right now is going through some adjustment with the new age of college football. Well, and it's interesting. I, I'll go with two guys that you've worked with in the past. So Eli Drinkwitz gave it up. And seems like he was pretty happy with that, with with how it worked with Kirby Moore, and then Mike Norvell. Yeah, I can't imagine him ever not calling plays. Like it, he just, it seems like that's kind of what makes him him as a head coach. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's fair to say. First of all, both those guys are excellent play callers. Yeah. I mean, some of the best in the country, and it worked for Eli. There's no doubt. I know he still had a, a good hand on what's going oh, yeah. on. But, uh, you know, that, that league, I mean, being a head coach in that league, that, that's a monster now. Okay, there's a lot more to it than some other leagues. And, then, of course, Mike, he's all you could tell as a GA. The dude's brilliant. And, uh, you know, he's so calm under pressure, and he's one of the best uh, that's doing it, you know, these days. How do, what, do you ever get a chance to, to sit back and think about the tree? Because we mentioned Mike, Eli, Rhett Lashley, yeah. Cody Burns, who's, who's yeah. in the NFL now. Mm -hmm. You've got a pretty good tree going. Yeah, it well, tells you I'm getting old. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but no, I I've been real blessed to be in the right situation a lot, right time to coach some big time players, and those guys were, you know, you could all tell they 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 were going to make it. I mean, uh, you know, they were really good with kids. They're great communicators. They're very smart. They're workers. They're getter dunners, and so it was really just all of the above. But I'm real proud of those guys. I mean, they're doing extremely well. Um, you know, Chip Lindsey. Yeah, you know, we had a top five offense in the country too. So, you know, there's a lot of good things going with our former guys. So this team now, you, you mentioned you brought in, uh, you know, quite a few guys from the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. I heard you say something in a press conference a few weeks ago that I found very interesting. You said even before you got here, UCF was always a place that was welcoming to transfers, and it, it seemed like a place where transfers could thrive. How does that work? Is it something that you you try to foster in the locker room to to bring when the new guys come in, or is it something that 
has just kind of been here? I think it's just been here. I mean, this is a, we're a young school. Um, you know, I really took over a great foundation. I mean, not just good players they left me, but a good culture. And it's just, uh, you know, for guys coming in, I mean, there's no jealousy. They want to win. Yeah. And, and they're true team guys. And that's really helped us, you know, with the transfers coming in, be successful. So, K.J. Jefferson, obviously the biggest name transferred. Yeah. I remember when when he said he was coming to UCF, mm-hmm. I thought, okay, if I could design a quarterback yeah. for Gus Malzahn office, that would be Cam Newton. But if, if we could have one mm-hmm. among the normal human beings, yeah, K.J. is probably it. Yeah, I, I'm real excited about K.J. Uh, you know, I recruited him out of high school, yeah. some, but Bo Nix was the same age. Yep. And obviously we weren't going to take two quarterbacks and – so, you know, I had my eye on him, obviously, being from Arkansas, and all my friends, a lot of my good friends are huge Arkansas fans, K.J. Jefferson fans. So when he went in the portal, he was our number one guy. And you're exactly right with what we like to do offensively. It doesn't get any better than his skill set. And I really think that he has the perfect skill set to thrive, you know, in our league and really in our offense. Well, and K.J. likes to run. And you come up, you know, coming off John Rice Pumley, who also was a great runner as well. But it's interesting because some of those guys that, that are good runners that have good arms just want to say, well, I, I just want to throw the ball. I don't I don't really – K.J.'s never been shy about yeah. running it too. Yeah. No, there's no doubt. But, I mean, I think he's Arkansas's all-time leading passer. Yeah. There's been great quarterbacks coming through the University of Arkansas. So that says a lot. But he's willing to run. Like, you know, when we were recruiting, Coach, man, whatever I need to do to help us win, you know, I'm going to do. and. So, you know, John Rice, you know, he really developed himself into a passer too. So, you know, but he is a, he's a really good fit for what we like to do. And he comes into an offense where the, the skill guys, yeah. you get a lot of old yeah. guys back. R.J. Harvey, mm-hmm. the 1,400 rushing yards is back. Uh, Kobe Hudson, did you did yeah. you think you were going to get him back? Uh, it, we knew, you know, he had opportunity. There was other people that were <laughs> coming after him real hard, yeah. not just the NFL, but other people. Uh, Xavier Townsend's a guy that, you know, is really electric, and I really feel like he's ready to take that next step. And uh, we've got some other young receivers that that have a chance to be really good and some good tight ends, too, uh, in a really solid offensive line. So we got the pieces of the puzzle for him to come in and be successful. So you you were talking about all the stuff that the head coach has to deal with now. Retention of the guys that are good on your roster. Yeah. How— how does that process work? I mean, is that an everyday process of just making sure they're happy and, and want to be here? And- yeah, you know, I think that's where it starts from a head coach's standpoint. As soon as that season's over, the number one thing I felt like I need to do is try to retain our top players. And, you know, a lot of the guys are, are being seeked out. And, you know, there's no rules anymore. They're getting recruited, right. and, and it's re- specific recruiting. So holding on to our guys. And we did a pretty solid job of that. And uh, But that's where it starts. I made a couple in-home visits to our own players. But – that's just a new age of college football, and really, that's where it starts for us. Is that weird? Like when you're in home with a guy who's been in your program for three years, it's, how strange is that? You know, I've done some in the past with the guys that are thinking about going to the NFL and all yeah. that, but I've never done with a portal, thinking about going to other schools in the portal, but that's just where everybody's at, and I'm sure I'm not the only head yeah. coach in, in the country doing that. Now, I, I've heard you talk about this before. You were a high school coach for a long time before mm-hmm. you came, became a college coach, and you've always said – that the skills you learn as a high school coach, whether it's lying in the field, driving the bus, yeah. dealing with mom, how does that translate to, to a lot of the stuff you have to deal with now? Yeah, you know, high school is about relationships and it's about adapting. And, you know, in high school, you're going to get, you know, your best players. It may look different from year to year position wise. So you got to adapt. You got to have a system that is building around the strengths of your best players. That's probably the biggest advantage I have being a former high school coach, not just being a GA and learning one system and you know it like the back of your hand, but they got to fit yeah. perfectly in that system. We have an offense that's flexible, that if we have a chance to get a great player, we know how to build around his strengths and our system flexible enough to do that. That's one of the best advantages I think I have being a former high school coach. So I was talking to, this is several years ago, I was doing a story on Mike Norvell and I called your former O-line coach from Springdale High School, and he was telling me that you had a situation. And I was thinking about this as I was listening to you talk about NIL and the different challenges. And he goes, we lost a kid to the rodeo one time. <laughs> so, like, kid coming to your you know, coming to your coach, I want to go, go do rodeo instead of play football. 
that's probably different than anything you deal with in NIL. That, that, that is different. <laughs> Springdale, they did rodeo. You had to adapt, okay? okay. And, you know, that was Don Strubing, my yep. former offensive line coach. So when I went to Tulsa, you know, I was going to try to take Rhett with me yep. to be the GA. Well, Rhett was going to get married. So he stayed in northwest Arkansas. So I said, hey, Don, who, who do you got? He said, man, Mike Norvell would be a great GA. So that's how that whole thing well, started. And, and so Rhett says there's this meeting at a gas station somewhere yeah. in the middle of Arkansas where, where basically Rhett is handing off your playbook to Mike Norvell and yep. then telling Mike how to deal with you. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. I said, man, Rhett, you got to meet with him. You got to show him exactly how we do it. And so they got together and Mike hit the ground running. I, that is that is crazy. And, okay, so the Eli Drinkwitz story is he was the manager who came along with the, the head coach of an all-star team? Yeah. Yeah, so I was the offense coordinator all-star team, right. which that was as good as it gets back in the day. And his head coach was a legend, and the head coach got to bring the manager. Yeah. And so there was a sophomore linebacker named Eli Drinkwitz, and so he was my GA or whatever back then. And so we got to know each other, and when he graduated, hey, coach, can I come volunteer for you at Springdale High School? Sure, man. He made a good impression yep. for me. And so that's how I went down, and I went to college. He moved up, and he was the offensive coordinator, and I think in 2009 we needed a, a GA. And so I made an in-home visit <laughs> with him and his wife and talked him into coming to Auburn for $12,000 <laughs> and to be a GA. And he got a chance to help with Cam Newton and the rest is history. It is unbelievable. It, 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 but it's funny because Mike – tells the story of you mentioned Don Stribling Mike shook Don Stribling's hand at a camp once like waited around so he could shake his hand and say I'm Mike Norvell nice to meet you yep. and if he doesn't do that mm -hmm. you never gets recommended to you I don't think that so. doesn't happen I don't think so but Mike he a smart guy yeah and you know that's just the way Mike is I mean he always thinks about the little things but that's exactly and you know, Don said, man, I just know this guy is going to be a great coach for you. He'll be just like Rhett and all this. Yeah. It worked out. Well, and, and so this staff, you, you've gotten you know, some guys that you've worked with before. Uh, Ted Roof's come to be yeah. defensive coordinator. I, I bumped into him out there. Yeah. I, the first thing I said to him was Antoine Carter, greatest hustle play in the history of football. It was. Uh, for those who don't remember, this is the Iron Bowl in 2010. Auburn's on the way to the national title, except they're about to lose to Alabama. Mark Ingram's about to score a touchdown. And Antoine Carter runs the length of the yeah. field and knocks the ball and out. And I think we may have been down 24 nothing at the time. It, we were, I think we were down 20, 21 nothing. Okay. And it yeah. would have been 28. And you would have lost. It wasn't yeah. looking good. Yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, Ted, we have experience together. We won a national championship together. Yep. We've kept in touch throughout the years. And so it really worked out. We're real blessed to have When it. you bring Tim Harris back. Uh, it, it, it's, it seems like it's a group that, that really knows each other pretty well. Yeah, Tim Harris, he's a rising star. Um, he was with us the first two years. I mean, did a super job. He goes to Miami for a year. Hired him back as a coordinator. He's a former head I was coach. Another former high school coach. Booker T. Washington, yep. number one team in the country. So we have a lot of former high school coaches that were very, very successful. And Tim, uh, you know, is one of those guys. Oh, I watched him coach a Booker T. Central game one year where it was more intense than any SEC game I've ever seen. So Yeah, he's used to winning, and uh, he has a true gift with players. He's very, very smart. He knows what we like to do offensively, and, you know, he's going to – we'll do it together. I mean, he, he's a right-hand man, and I have a lot of confidence in him. So how do you balance uh, – you bring in, you know, quite a bit of transfer. You kind of split the class between transfers and high school. How do you decide how – how much you want to devote to either one? Well, first of all, we're gonna we're committed to build this thing through high schools. I think we signed 19 and 18, and every year you just gotta after the portal opens up, like what are the immediate needs? And so we will address immediate needs, but I really believe the foundation for us to be able to win a championship starts in the high school. There's great players around here, and when we got here, our whole goal was to keep our our top players here recruit everybody they may leave but if they don't like it we're going to be waiting on them to come back home and so you're starting to see the plan uh you know really come into place but the bottom line is we want to build this thing with high school players and how much has is, is the move to the big 12 we've known about for a while but now that you've played in it for a year when you're talking to those guys that are in the class of 25 26 does it change how they consider you look at you 100 percent. everything has changed it's really helped Two that we went through a year and able to have the home games and then there's some real atmospheres yeah. with some real teams coming in 
and for those recruits to see it and feel it, they all want to play big time ball. Yeah, this is big time ball now, and that's been a game well, Oklahoma changer. Oklahoma State comes in like the hottest team in the yeah. country, and you guys have maybe your best game of the year. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt we we really did, and you know we've got a really good home schedule again next year, and uh, so everything is trending in the right direction. So that stadium actually does bounce. What is it like down on the field when when it starts to bounce? I, I tell you. It is the, everybody's on top of you. It's a different feel from a coach player standpoint than any place I've been to because they're so close to you. Yeah. But you do hear them bouncing. It'll it freaked me out a little bit the first year we're in the locker room and before the game the doors are shaking like whoa what's going on but now I'm used to it but it does bounce. That's a true home field advantage. <laughs> That's right. Gus Malzahn, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder. Subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On 3 Sports YouTube channel.